this is going to be my review of Sensei Sef's Learning Pankration video. For those that are new to the channel, my name is Athanasios Bonas. I've been researching Pankration for over 20 years, and I have recently been published in the IJHS. This is the first academic peer-reviewed publication dealing with Pankration's techniques. I'll leave a link to the study in the description. I have not seen this, I have only skimmed through parts of it, so the review will be in the style of a quote-unquote reaction video. I have also not seen any other videos from this content creator, so keep that in mind. Now, right off the bat, just from the title, I can tell you with certainty that he didn't try pankration, but we'll probably get into that more in the video. Let's begin. Pankration. Pankration, or pankration, or even pankration, four syllables, never three. Let's move on. Had almost no rules. He bit me! Yes, the classic pankration had no rules. I've covered this in the five myths video, and it's unfortunately something that even academic scholars perpetuate. So the rule set of no biting and no gouging comes from a scholar of the 2nd to 3rd century CE. This is written in prose and simplified, not a means for preserving the rules of the sport for posterity. There are rules that can be inferred from the analysis of visual depictions, ancient texts, and archaeological findings. For example, take Pisidia, where there is an inscription with the rules present for the Pankration contest of that competition. Specifically, it prohibits the use of wrestling or grappling whatsoever, so it was more like a contest of kickboxing. You can infer that this rule set was in effect even centuries before this inscription from the stance of Pankratias of antiquity. These stances are almost identical to Muay Thai, where the stance is made to defend against kicks and is pretty ineffective against takedowns. Of course, the Pankration stance was fluid, but this is still a display of a very striking heavy style of fighting. He bit me! No clothes. <laughs> no, 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 no. I've mentioned this several times in many videos, but Pankratias did wear a loincloth called Perizoma, which is only absent from statues and vases for artistic reasons. Pan in Greek means all, okay. and kratos is, is the word meaning power or force or violence. And so the Pankration was a sport, a sort of all-in brand of fighting. You see, what he says here is verifiably wrong. And if he wrote a book on Pankration without knowing what the word itself means, it makes me worried about the content of that book. Pan does mean all, but Kratos does not necessarily mean any of what he mentioned. This is a problem when you see a Greek word, open a dictionary, and just go for the first translation that pops up. Kratos can mean might and power, but it does not in the context of Pankration. How is this verifiably false? There's two different words that have both pan and kratos together. We have pankration and we have pankratis. The latter is used to describe Zeus the Almighty, not Zeus pankratiastis, Zeus pankratis. In the context of the sport, pankration means all plus mastery, as in mastering all the different aspects of combat, boxing, wrestling, kicking, and groundwork. And no, Kratos does not mean violence in any form or translation. It wasn't the earliest combat sport among the Greeks. Wrestling is the oldest one, and then boxing. And then at some point, they come up with this new sport, the Pankration. All right, here you can't put a date on the origin of different sports simply by the date of which they entered the Olympics first. Yes, wrestling did come before boxing in the Olympics, but then you have a fresco from Minoan era Greece displaying youths boxing with gloves dated seven or eight hundred years before wrestling entered the Olympics, so it's not that simple. With Pankration, the only rules were that you couldn't bite and you couldn't eye gouge. Again, this is a single Roman era source from a scholar and not an athlete or a gonothete. So groin strikes, be our guest. First of all, no, there were no groin strikes in Pankration. I go through this in my published article where I mention Polyakov's description of a vase where he states it shows a groin strike. But the same scene appears on other vases and it's clear that it's not a groin strike. It's just that the leg is lifted because the fighter is lunging forward. If any of you watching this have sparred or competed in any striking art, you know that this simultaneous punching and kicking translates to no power in either strike and only accomplishes to put you off balance. The relief that they show is Roman era, and again, it's debatable whether it shows a groin strike, but there are no pre-Roman depictions that display anything that can be interpreted as a groin strike. If it was legal, you'd see it. Headbutts, go right ahead. 
Now he mentions headbutts. These were also not allowed. If he claims them to be legal, why not show a pottery painting displaying a headbutt? We know that when headbutts are allowed, they're used often and are incredibly dangerous, as is evidenced by Lethway. So surely, if they were legal, we'd have plenty of examples in surviving imagery or even text. Where are they? Why are you showing a wrestling clinch? Spoilers, there are none. Grabbing the opponent's shorts? Like to see a try. And even grabbing the perizoma, though it may have occurred, there's no evidence that suggests that it did. So this is just more gratuitous misinformation. Submission, they didn't tap, they'd hold finger up, right? So we'll have uh, images of, a uh, uh, you know, one athlete on the ground with his finger up. Uh, hello, I'm quitting. And yeah, we have even more confidently incorrect statements. Lifting the index finger was not the only way to submit. There was also tapping, even as far in as the Roman era. How do you write a book on Pancration's groundwork and not read one of the most prominent surviving sources, which is Lucian? The term for tapping was paracrotein and is described explicitly in text. You just fought until you either destroyed your opponent or the opponent submitted but holding up the, the finger. This whole destroy the opponent is nonsense. If you follow the channel, you know that there is only one recorded death related to Pankration in the pre-Roman eras. There were many reasons why deaths were so rare to almost non-existent. The Panhellenic Games held a truce, so all city-states could compete. Having someone kill a competitor from a different city-state due to maliciousness or recklessness, even with the religious aspects aside, the games were meant to honor the gods, there would have also been judicial consequences related to athletic events, and there would be conflicts arising that had the potential to undermine the impartiality of the events themselves. Let's move on. We'd then make our way across the campus to the Olympic Stadium, where within a tournament of Pankration could have up to 132 competitors. The size of this thing is kind of hard to comprehend. But in this hot, sandy arena, our match would begin. Pankratia's boxers and wrestlers fought in the Altis or the Palestra, depending on the event, not in the stadium. They did so in the late afternoon, and Pankration did not take place in sand. I mean, did they get this idea from Assassin's Creed Odyssey or something? Anyway. And Agonas. <laughs> I, you know, I'm trying not to be too negative, but you're saying you have an author of a book on ancient Hellenic athletics in that room, and no one knows the word for Agon? The literal translation of Olympic Games is Olympiaki Agones. I know this is made to look like a joke, but I would, I would be embarrassed. So in the in the paint the vase paintings, man, these guys have these long switches that are clearly flexible, and they are whipped, wham, and they are slamming them down on the athlete, for, uh, causing a foul. I mean, I love how they make these statements based on absolutely nothing but their own perceptions, whipping and whamming their opponents. Why don't you show it? Show us the vase depictions that display ground and pound. Show a full mount. Show whamming and whipping. They don't show them because they don't exist. And even when they do show them, really just describe them using their own imagination. Take this vase, okay? Polyakov describes it as, quote, a Pankratias gouging and pummeling his opponent and the referee does not interfere. Anyone with even basic knowledge of groundwork knows that this is not a position from which you can pummel. He does not have a steady hold, and it appears that the hand that is missing here from the vase is actually him holding his opponent's leg rather than winding up a strike. Other than this, anything that even resembles a depiction of a strike on a grounded opponent has the fighter standing. There's not a single vase depiction that displays a proper mount for ground and pound, in spite of how often it arises when ground and pound is legal. Other than that, we have textual confirmations that ground and pound was not used, like Pindar and Lucian. So if you're going to make these statements and you have the book in question on hand, back your claim up, show what you're talking about, provide a source. There's quite a few submissions. Strangles, small joint manipulation was legal, so there's even one particular athlete that comes down that's famous for breaking fingers. Yeah, finger, uh, finger breaker or finger man as he's called. Finger and, man. Yeah. And <laughs> this, this finger breaking is very much debatable. It's something that again is mentioned even in academia, but I only find it in Roman sources, Pafsanias in particular, and it really doesn't make sense for Pankration. I haven't found small joint manipulation in any vase paintings, and it really wouldn't make sense to allow joint locks on 
the fingers of the hand when showing a finger is a method of submission. It's me from ancient Greece now. Fun fact, did you know that the ancient Greeks sweat? They, they sweated, they lost a lot of water, but also a lot of salt to go with that. Another fun fact, did you know that the ancient Greeks drank element? Am I allowed to lie on this thing? Yeah, apparently you are allowed to lie on this thing. To be fair, it's probably more so a matter of ignorance and malicious lies, but at what point does a complete lack of research leading to the spread of misinformation to such a large audience become an act of malevolence rather than ignorance? But yeah, by all means, use my cultural heritage to promote your supplements. Ability these people have fighting nine times. You've been to Olympia out in the sun in the summer and the heat nine times. There's no water at Olympia, so they're probably all dehydrated. No. Did he just say they didn't have water in Olympia? Yes, there was a problem during some Olympiads with water for the visitors, but not for the athletes and trainers. I mean, come on, man. They'd be dying from heat exhaustion left and right. You don't think they brought water with them? Pankration in the ancient Olympics started in 648 BC and lasted until 393 AD. Not sure where he got the 393 AD from. I mean, the last recorded Olympics? Because those probably did not include all the sports and... The latest Pankratias champion I was able to find was in 221 CE, and I found that from a fragment of a papyrus. <laughs> they probably wouldn't because the, the sort of moral implications right. would make them feel ashamed. So you, like, you would basically, I think, tough it out to yeah. the point that you absolutely couldn't. Have. Okay, these moral obligations are more a product of the modern era perpetuated from the gladiatorial mindset that they were of ancient Greece. There was no shame in recognizing when you had been bested and admitted defeat. This is a far more honorable approach than pretending to be the victor and making excuses. The only city-state that did recognize that they could not submit due to Lycurgian laws were the Spartans, and instead of carrying that mindset into these combat sports events, they simply didn't participate. I'm not saying it didn't exist altogether, but I have not found a single text criticizing a combat sports athlete for submitting or not going the extra mile. Longer and then or you, until you die. Or the, yeah, <laughs> according to the story about Arikian, his, his trainer shouted out to him at the critical point, what a wonderful honor it would be to die at Olympia unsubmitted. And yes, Arikion, I knew it would come up. It's because they have like a checklist of misinformation that they have to go through. In the last moments of Arikion's life, he won via submission and simultaneously collapsed. We're assuming from heat exhaustion. Although, I'll give them credit here. They're not sticking to the common narrative and they acknowledge that there is no way Arikion could have been killed by a stranglehold or even the breaking of his neck, which is what Brophy argues. There's a great article on the subject of Arigion, which I'll link in the description. Just note that these Roman scholars, Pafsanias and Philostratos and so forth, are giving dramatized descriptions of events that happened over half a millennium before their time. The coach yelling how great it would be to leave Olympia unsubmitted. This is something that you'd see in a movie. No athlete being choked out is going to hear that. It's just a theatrical imagining of events. And just like the account of Krugus or Glavkos of Karistus, it's really just dramatizations. These sports were presented really in honor of the gods. It was for Zeus at Olympia, for instance, where, where you were. And that's why being a victor was, was such a wonderful thing to have, because it was, it was like you were touching the, the realm of the gods right. yeah. um, and victory herself is always depicted as, as a winged figure flying through the sky so you have to you have to really work hard to, to grasp victory it's sort of richly symbolic in, in that way yeah. um, so the whole thing was as you say infused with religious significance everything he says here about the religious significance of the events is accurate and given what he says in the religious significance, and the notion of hubris, which I'm sure you all know, how could one state that athletes would fight their opponents recklessly to the death, in a setting like this? Alright, it's absolutely riddled with misinformation. At what point did he try Pankration in the video? A few minutes of rolling with uh, small joint manipulation, that's it? And I know I'm going to catch plenty of heat from this YouTuber's audience, given that influencers tend to cultivate cult-like followings. I'm not saying it's the case for him, but that's usually how it is. And it's one of the reasons why I never cared to become one, and why I don't put on a curtain or Halloween costume to make thumbnails. My goal was, is, and always will be, to show 
a properly researched and academically sound version of what I mention in my videos, be it of pancration, of the workout routines, and so forth. Mistakes are inevitable, and they are part of the process. But this is not just mistakes. If I can do my due diligence and research while making no money off this platform, I'd expect a professional YouTuber to do the same, if not more. Then again, this platform is meant for sensationalism, unfortunately, or fortunately, if that's what you're into, I guess. Now, many people have suggested a collaboration. This is something that you can communicate to him and or to the author of the book that's being advertised in the video. I'm open to the idea, but I'm not going to pursue it myself. Hopefully, I'll get the opportunity to write a book on Pankration with an academic publisher, but to do so, I need to be able to show that there's interest for it. So if it does interest you, make sure your voice is heard. Cheers. Pancration.